Good afternoon. My name is Taylor Brown. I am a sophomore at Albany State University studying English. Um, I'm going to introduce Raquel Henry to you guys. No, excuse me, Dr. Raquel Henry. Dr. Raquel Henry is a native of Indianapolis, Indiana, with ancestral roots in Southwest Georgia, Pine Mountain, and Bainbridge. She received her PhD in history from Indiana University. Dr. Henry is currently working on a book about the civil rights movement and act activists in Indiana during the 19th century. She is also still working to collect oral histories of students involved in the Albany civil rights movement. In addition, Dr. Henry has continued to investigate how the resistance of African Americans connects to the larger experience of people of color, both in America and on the continent of Africa. Dr. Henry believes that it is from these small acts of resistance, such as those from young people, most recently in Ferguson, Missouri, hands up, don't shoot, that larger changes will be made in American society. Dr. Raquel Henry, you guys. Thank you. Um, the title of my presentation today is From the Albany Bible and Manual Training Institute to Albany State College, the Building of a Student Movement. Now my historic journey into what is Albany State's student activist movement history during 2010 and 2011 developed from an interest in African American history and a concern for what this particular group's efforts at resistance to injustice were during the 1950s to early 1960s. The research on Albany State College's 40 students started with reading more than 50 books on civil rights, most of which covered the era of what many scholars call the master narrative. Um, the narrative of civil rights starts in the 1940s and turbulently flows into the early 1970s, according to these scholars. The next aspect of my work focused while I was here at Albany State on finding all the names of the 40 students and developing viable relationships with many of them and unearthing a narrative that had been forgotten by some and covered over by others. Though painful for many among the symbolic ASC activist class of 1961, um, there were yet other students who took their experiences and changed them into a badge of cur courage and made a lifelong commitment to striving to follow through on what started when they were part of the Albany Civil Rights Movement. After the celebration commemorating these students at the university and the research there were a series of trends that I noticed that developed. It is these trends that inform my presentation today. My focus on the movement as it concerns Albany State, it is my contention that the students become activists because of two very important factors. The first considers the administrative agendas of Joseph Hawley, Aaron Brown, and William H. Dennis. What is significant about their presidencies, whether they were conscious of it or not, was the fact that they prepared the environment that allowed for a foundational shift, opening the floodgate that unleashed student angst and frustration against the Jim Crow system of the times. The second factor that encouraged their activism was the African American community in both Albany, Georgia and across the South. Through lessons in survival, 
sweeping changes in civil rights across the South in the 1950s, and the addition of childhood encounters with racism, the students were changed. Further, when they arrived at Albany State, the final stages of their transformation were meted out by both community and college leaders. Dr. Irene Moore Asbury, which is what her name started out to be, and later Wright after she married Victor Wright, administered the student government leadership training. Thomas Chapman was their advisor in the NAACP Youth Council, and Charles Sherrod, Charles Jones, and Cordell Regan trained and supported them in SNCC's methodology. Once their life training met with the opportunity to change the political and social pariah that plagued Southern society, this was the beginning of the student segment of the Albany Civil Rights Movement. <coughs> now, another issue of great importance that will end my discussion is what happened to the students after their suspension or expulsion from the college. Now, what makes part of the discussion so in, that make, what makes the discussion so interesting is considering how some of the students so, sojourned on, and others suffered from what resembled post-traumatic stress disorder. The battle scars either aided in their future work or hindered them. And this is something that became very significant because this influenced the relationship that I had with each student that I contacted in 2010. Now, the first trend mentioned earlier that was a foundation shift for the entrance of the Albany um, State College Civil Rights Activist was the tenure of Dr. Holly, which many scholars consider to be an era of building for Negro education in Southwest Georgia. And it is foundation shifting for the students that were activists in 1961 because the hallowed ground which provided the incubator for their freedom to react was built by Holly. If you think of the fact that if he had not had the courage to come to this community and negotiate with whites, the stage would not have been set. But though he completes this Herculean task, he fails in many different ways. But his failings open another door of opportunity for these young people 14 years after he is removed by the Georgia Chancellor and Board of Regents. So, his failures actually turn into a positive. Now, I like to refer to his time as president as an epoch of sacrificial Washingtonian politics and pecans. Though he gives a nod to Du Boisian philosophy after reading two chapters in Souls of Black Folk on Daugherty County, the talented 10th, Pan-Africanism and the NAACP were far from Holly's mind in his thoughts about starting an institution of learning in Southwest Georgia. He was much more a Washingtonian. He honestly believed that white Southerners had an interest in the African-American <laughs> after 200 year, 250 years of slavery. He was a staunch segregationist who believed, as Booker T. Washington said in his Atlanta exposition speech, African Americans in our humble way shall stand by whites with a devotion no foreigner can approach, ready to lay down our lives in defense of yours. But in all things purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet in all things essential to mutual progress. And Holly depended on the kindness of white leadership in the town of Albany, just as Washington had in the town of Tuskegee. Whatever the political and social cost among his own people, he approached them to sit on the Institute board. 
he asked for land on the eastern edge, just outside the city limits where criminals resided, because he did not dare trouble whites by locating on Slappy Drive, in the heart of where whites had built homes and found a colored presence distressing. It was sympathetic whites that he also sent pecans and letters to, pleading for money to support a fledgling school, Albany Bible and Manual Institute. Though he understood the nature of society in the South and its inner workings for African-American leaders, he failed to see the handwriting on the wall for African-Americans who were willing to toady up to white racist politicians. He was going to be burned by both communities, black and white. His scorching begins when he develops close political relations with Governor Hugh Dorsey to garner aid from the state of Georgia to fulfill the financial needs of the academy. Later, he works hard to prevent the Albany Institute from losing its standing of a seat of learning in Southwest Georgia. Many on the Board of Regents wanted to replace the three African-American units of higher learning at the time with one central institution in Atlanta. The legislature and regents wanted to cut the HBCU's umbilical cord in the 1933 to 34 years. And Holly wanted to try again at unifying the HBCUs across the state under a board of control for better funding. His political maneuverings, he thought, convinced the chancellor and regents to go along, but later the chancellor did not follow through and Holly failed. Yes, this started as a worthy cause, but as time moved on and Eugene Talmadge became governor in 1940, Holly's segregationist attitudes surface as he becomes to some in the state the unofficial voice on African-American education. Talmadge, in a meeting with Holly, decides that he would try to put Holly forward as a candidate for chancellor of the three Negro units. The regents went to all the units seeking support against Holly. So by August 11th, 1942, the regents and government officials met in Tifton, Georgia. Holly, considering the repercussions of the chancellor and a fourth of the Board of Regents against him backed out. And instead of his appointment, he asked that a study committee be selected to consider how the HBCUs could be improved. This game with the regents prevented Holly's ascension to the office of Chancellor of African American Schools throughout the state, and it cost him his reputation. Black and white newspapers were against the idea because everyone knew he was Talmadge's man. The governor was a known racist and segregationist. Talmadge's bottom line was preventing race mixing in higher education, and Holly wanted the status quo because he believed integration was not the answer to improving African American education in the region. Dr. Joseph Holly's background manipulation of the governor and his cronies in his administration against the regents and chancellor cost him his job. And it was in 1943 that the chancellor and regents removed him from his post. His removal turns into a positive because it is a beginning of a new age at Albany State and the beginning of the necessary changes that would set the stage for the activists from 1961. And though racism in educational funding and HBCUs in Georgia suffered difficulties, Washingtonian policies no longer would work at the college. Though historically the founder of Albany State is seen as a sympathizer to maintaining the racial status quo willing to sacrifice African Americans' place at the table of equality, Holly did this one grand thing. He left behind as his legacy for the new age, 
Albany State College, which changes its name just as Aaron Brown is coming into office in 1943. Now, the next president, whether the regents understood it or not, instead of building physical facilities, increasing quality faculty and aiding the white community, Holly's plans, the building would be much more black community focused. Under Brown, and that's Dr. Aaron Brown, his efforts truly were considered a time of spreading the activist seed over fallow ground because his work at the college and in the community made room for student self-expression that once unleashed finally in 1961, created emotional fervor in Albany State College's young people that would rock Albany at its very core and alter the struggle for equality forever. He laid the foundation for these students at the college because he was interested in developing the black consciousness of faculty and students. Yes, he was interested in maintaining good relations with the larger white community, but not at the cost of African American rights within that community. From the beginning of his 10-year run as leader of the newly renamed Albany State College on the side of civil rights, Brown requested that Savannah's NAACP establish a chapter at Albany State in 1943. In fact, there was a membership drive in 1944 and he pushed for a thousand faculty and students to join. And according to historian Lee Formwalt, the NAACP chapter at the college continued after Brown was fired by the Georgia Board of Regents with the establishment of the Youth Council in the committee that was responsible for the development of many of Albany State College's student activist leaders in 1959. Now, in the Youth Council, students like Annette Jones, Janie Colbreth, Evelyn Tony, Andrew Williams, Bernice Johnson, Annie Booyer, and Bobby Birch found a place to put all their energy into changing Jim Crow. Writing letters to store owners to change hiring practices and later sending a delegation to discuss changes with the store owner that, by the way, was in Harlem, Little Harlem, was part of the training with the council. Now, beyond the establishment of an NAACP chapter on campus, Brown also led the first charge to put an end to white men speeding through Albany State College's campus. But this effort of complaint to Albany's city commissioners yielded nothing because the students in SGA in 1960 and later the activists confront this same problem. Brown also made an effort to analyze the plight of African Americans in the community. He wrote a 70-page treatise on the state of apartheid in Albany that revealed the harm that Jim Crow continued to cause. His research left a legacy of knowledge black consciousness that is a veritable forerunner to the Afrocentric knowledge dropping of radical activists like Stokely Carmichael of the later 1960s after nonviolent protests gave way to immediatist action. Now, Brown himself can be historically viewed as an activist that pays a high price for his support of voting rights and the significance of getting the word out because of his participation in the Voters League. He introduced a speaker at the League's meeting and was condemned by the white media. And when James Gray in the Albany Herald accused him of supporting African-American bloc voting, attorney B.C. Gardner, and that name sounds familiar, sent the Albany Herald clippings to the chancellor and his contract was not renewed. The rumor was circulated in my own research that I found that Brown resigned, but he always denied this accusation. He contended that he was fired by the regents, and it is this historian's belief 
that his voters league rally participation was the stra final straw for the regents. The newspaper article only put the final nail in his coffin. Because of all his radical community work, Brown was a commodity that many in the white community found threatening. Because of all his radical, excuse me, he set the table for Albany State's young civil rights soldiers to step up and continue to carry the mantle that changed Albany white society. As Brown was making preparations at the college, and I'm making a shift to the students. The Albany State 40 were simultaneously being transformed by the African American community nationally and locally. In many of the student narratives recorded during the celebration, their shifts become apparent with each funny and sad anecdote describing the ups and downs of life in Albany as youngsters at the college and in the city as a movement rose from the ground up, ebbing and flowing as Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan has stated in hands on the freedom plow with plenty of room for young people. There was indeed plenty of room for young people because they were the only group in the beginning really willing with fear and trembling to take all the risk of losing crowns, scholarships, jobs, and going to jail to raise a grassroots movement in its infancy that combined direct action with nonviolent protests, whether spontaneous or planned. In order for the above involvement to happen, there had to be an evolutionary process. And these prepubescent activists reached this magic time in history because each went through a life-altering encounter or encounters that forever shaped their paths. And I refer to this section of their lives as a period when the Albany African American community built them up introducing them to their purpose, thus helping them to understand that they had to bring change to an unequal social and political system. It was up to their generation to make things better. Students such as Alton Moultrie, Gail Hall, Annette Jones, Walter Armstrong, and Janie Colbreth are examples of individuals who, as children, used each lesson from their teachers at Carver Junior High, Monroe High, and the African American one room schoolhouse that was in Daugherty County. Um, stories and discipline from their parents. And each racist event gave them the readiness necessary to enter the field of nonviolent battle when Charles Sherrod showed up on the scene. Many of them spoke about this trifecta of their development as a natural progression. Now, the biggest part of building these activists up was the closeness of the African American Albany community. Much of the community was self-contained because of segregation, and this permitted parents to watch out for and take care of a neighbor's child, whether up the street or on the other side of town. It did truly take a village to raise a child. And in an interview with Annette Jones White, she discussed how her grandmother's friends used to take her to church as a child. Alton Maltry also reminisced about how his parents, as a rule, did not allow their children to go into downtown Albany without an adult. He contended that children could go into O.C. George's grocery store, the King's grocery store, and other black-owned businesses, but places like Cress's 10 Cent Store or Belk's Department Store were off limits. In fact, in many of the interviews I conducted, from Annette Jones White, Walter Armstrong, James Jones, and others, when they talked about their first childhood experiences with Jim Crow, it was in the company of their parents who protected them. Now, an instance of this was when I was interviewing Gail Hall, who grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and returned to Albany in the summer to stay with her family. Now, 
how she was taught this particular lesson was with her grandmother at Belk's department store. And she had to be dragged out of the store kicking and screaming because she refused to accept the fact that she had to drink warm water from the colored fountain. She went directly to the white fountain because in New Bedford, Massachusetts, she interacted with whites on a very regular basis. So she could not understand. But in the end, her grandmother forced her to learn because she wanted to save them both from a trip to jail if a store clerk had decided to call the authorities because of her actions. Alton Moultrie is another who talks about this same type encounter when his little brother tried to drink from the white water fountain at Belk's department store. The clerk at the counter raised her voice and screamed at Alton's brother. And his mother came to her son's defense because she told the clerk he was too young to understand segregationist expectations. According to the current social system, African Americans were not equals at the time. And Aldemara Maltry had to explain when she got home to her sons, and she had a huge number of sons. She had to tell all of them that segregation was going to be something that they had to learn to adjust to. That because of their skin color, as long as they lived in Albany, and this was not changed, they were going to have to be weary of the system and avoid it at all cost whenever possible. Now, James Jones was another example because his grandmother pulled all of them in one night when she heard there was going to be a Ku Klux Klan rally, and he's about nine years old, and she makes all of them come in and she turns all the lights out because she says that whenever there is a Ku Klux Klan rally in Albany, Georgia, an African-American dies. And sure enough, the next morning, an African-American man that was riding down Byron Road was missing and was never heard from again. Now, there were other ways that parents taught their children about surviving in a segregationist South. Some would circumvent their children's exposure, as I said, by warning them with stories about the Klan and then telling them that they had to change things. And it was Annette Jones's parents, Paul and Dolores Jones, that used to have fireside chats, as she called them, with all of their children about the state of black life in their family and community. And they uh, impressed upon their children that they had to make life better in Albany, Georgia. Now, beyond the efforts of parents to prepare their children for life in the South, school teachers were an influence on the Albany State College 40. Maltrie and Walter Armstrong talked about how good Monroe High School was during the 50s because of the teachers. Maltrie mentions role models like McCree Harris, B.B. White, and Miss Chapman, Thomas Chapman's wife, and how they influenced him. It was the teachers who taught them about rights, took them to register to vote before graduating from high school, and aided them in understanding the meaning of the Constitution, and made them understand that learning about it was not merely an exercise in memorization. It was also the educators for some students that introduced them to newspapers and magazines that carried national events. In evaluating all of the data I collected about the students that participated in Albany State College's um, civil rights movement, um, they learned about the Montgomery bus boycott, Brown versus the Board of Education, 
Emmett Till's death and the developing sit-in movement of the late 1950s by reading those newspapers. <coughs> Many of them were greatly influenced, especially the members of the NAACP Youth Council, because that was another place where they discussed and read about national civil rights events and the different issues of inequality in their own community and strategies to press for change. Now, Andrew Williams, a member of this group, was one who in the interview that I conducted with him talked about how deeply Emmett Till's death struck a chord of hurt and anger within his spirit. He ended that conversation by saying that within his heart strongly, he was left with a sense that something had to change. Now the erasure events when the students became teenagers preparing to move on to college elevated the rebellion in their spirits. And one incident in particular, as older teenagers, took place with Janie Colbreth. Now, she deliberately, she told me, as an older teen, went into Silver's 10 cent store on the weekends to buy her school supplies every week. And she told me that the clerk would throw whatever it is that you had purchased down on the counter and would throw your change at you. So as many weekends as possible, she said, her and her friends were determined to undermine this caste system of race by drinking from the cool waters of the whites only drinking fountain. And she said, each time they committed this sin against white dominance, uh, for them, it was like throwing a rock at a hornet's nest. The store clerk, as they ran out, would shout at them, you are not allowed to drink from the white drinking fountain. They were risking going to jail and their parents finding out about their misdeeds. Colbreth had, she told me, pent up frustration by that point, that she had no outlet but in spurts and I like to call those spurts popcorn protest calls, even though it was not formal. And those protest calls are what I like to think of as a spontaneous decision to thumb his or hers nose directly in the face of the Jim Crow system and its enforcers. Now, another similar incident was a spontaneous decision by Annette Jones White not to move over on the sidewalk because several Albany High School white boys were coming down the street. There was an unwritten law in Albany that African Americans were to get off the sidewalks when whites approached. She was taught by her mother, Dolores White, to casually walk over and window shop to avoid confrontation and save her dignity but this time was different. She was too involved in her own personal <clears throat> excitement about her birthday gifts, and the three young men had gotten too close within 10 feet. So Jones was not going to give them the satisfaction of seeing her move abruptly. She told me she had pride. She stilled herself and decided to throw her head up in dignity and keep on walking. The young white male walking closest to her as they approached clearly in meanness elbowed her and hit Jones lifting her off the sidewalk because she only weighed 95 pounds in a maneuver that was later called throwing the bone. She was bruised, maintained her dignity, and struck a blow for African-American equality. Jones and the others took their understanding of this segregation, this system, and for many, not all, their rebellious nature to Albany State. While the students were sharpening and developing, Dr. William H. Dennis had been an adjunct when many of them were young babes in the mid 40s. And after finishing his doctorate, he becomes a full professor. And when Dr. Brown is removed, Dennis is placed in his position. He was the president 
that brings to mind the slogan, keep it in line, keep it in line, because activism is furthest from our minds. But he paid the highest price and learned a valuable lesson. His life lesson was that once the activist genie was out of the bottle, it could never be put back because these civil rights soldiers continue to march forward even with his threats and follow through to end <laughs> academic careers. In many ways, Dennis created this moment of kismet, as I like to call it, civil rights activist. When his administration sent Joe Darden to offer Dr. Irene Moore Asbury, the position as Dean of Students at Albany State. Now, the reason why she was offered the post was because the man the college had first hired, his wife saw Albany and immediately refused to live here. She told him that they were going back to where they came from and he followed her. This clearly was fate. Wright had to be there to administer her brand of student agency and leadership that SGA, SGA students at Spelman and Morehouse already understood quite well. And she further had to be there because it was Wright, Slater King, and other Lincoln, Lincoln Heights folk who together um, protected Albany State College's 40 and the SNCC kids. Now, Dennis further ignited this moment of kismet when he refused to listen or genuinely allow student government to change a lack of general security for all of its students. Whites racing through campus, down Hazard Drive, unwillingness to reprimand Hattie Bird's roach-filled food in the cafeteria, the lack of protection for female students from rape and a refusal to hire more security on campus, and his over-exuberance in enforcing the Georgia Board of Regents May 1960 bylaws about suspension or expulsion if a student was arrested and convicted of federal state law led him into trouble. President Dennis was in a very complex situation as the leader at Albany State because every time the student government set a plan into motion to circumvent his denial of their agency, racist whites in the community began a terrorist campaign with a barrage of hate phone calls and an increase in hate responses in the Albany Herald, not to mention the heightened physical threats on campus. Now, an instance of student leadership defiance and an increase in white terrorism was in the Leonard Carson letter that students placed in the Albany Herald on January the 24th, 1961, after members of SGA spontaneously decided in the snack shop to put an end to WALB's daily racist diatribe concerning the integration of the University of Georgia. There were a series of angry responses in the People's Forum on January the 31st in the Albany Herald from the white community. And it was out of fear of retaliation from the white community, anger with defiant students, and a desire to assure the Board of Regents that he had the matter under control, that Dennis had a retraction printed in the Herald denying the existence of Leonard Carson. Further proof of my above assertions are evident when he then calls an emergency meeting to reprimand students and warn them off this dangerous course of defiance. But instead of quietly accepting his demands, as he denies there is existence of Leonard Carson at Albany State, Bernice Johnson, now Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, courageously stands and declares there are 500 Leonard Carsons at Albany State, and her peers respond with clapping and cheers. But Dennis only bared down harder on the students. After a series of other events with SGA, Dennis locks 
SGA's office and suspends student government because he is determined to put an end to what he most likely perceives as a chaotic storm on the horizon. But instead of achieving this aim, his efforts only stoked the fires of revolution in their spirits. He could have taken a different tact because every HBCU in Georgia was faced with much of the same set of segregationist circumstances. Yes, there is the issue of urban versus rural with some HBCUs, but that did not stop President Benjamin Mays of Morehouse from telling, and this is Andrew Williams that he tells this, one of the students from Albany State that he could do what he wanted but Mays admitted him for one thing, an education. President Mays, an activist himself, did not try to stop students from being part of the movement, but he had to abide by the same policies at Albany State's president. Dennis could have used Booker Washington's strategies of wearing the mask for white folks in Tuskegee, but Dennis did not choose to do that in Albany and the board, but allowed students, he would not, excuse me, allow students to have their space to protect themselves and have a level of agency, increase security on campus and protect females. Now, in considering this example of Dennis's behavior, we must look at the fact that unconsciously he set student defiance into motion because he would not relent on anything. His administration hired Wright. Dennis and Jordan knew about her work at Spelman and Morehouse. She revolutionized student government by changing the paradigm. This new model for student government came from a conference she attended at Chatham College in the 1950s. The paradigm changed in matters such as food, academics, health, social life, and financial aid. Students would have the authority to meet with faculty, advising them, to uh, allowing them to make decisions. Now, this new model specified that if students had grievances, they could solve it themselves with their faculty advisor instead of going to the president. Only as a last resort would matters be taken to executive levels at the college. Now, Wright tried this at Albany State when the students came at first in 1960 with a summer conference. But as time moved on, she found out that that would not work. In fact, she told me she received a letter from a lady that had owned the home that she was renting telling her that the young people in this area that were workers on plantations that surrounded the city would not be able to follow through on many of the things that she asked. So in the end, by the time we get to the fall of 1961, when Charles Sherrod and Cordell Regan show up with Charles Jones to begin the process of testing the ICC ruling, you end up with students and a community on many levels who are ready to change things in Albany, Georgia. And it is here after a series of arrests, because I can't talk about everything because I have more, because <laughs> this is a very long narrative that I adore. But in the end, after being arrested a series of times, when they are arrested, Dennis immediately suspends each one of them because he has spies that are involved in the movement marches and at the mass meetings that go back and tell him who was there. Annette Jones White is threatened. And Bertha Gober and Blanton Hall are suspended after being arrested, and so too are Evelyn Tony. Now, but after the Freedom Riders, that second group that come in on the train during December, both the Gober is arrested again. There are more letters of suspension sent out. And we get to January. All of the students are expelled and suspended. 
and many of them refused to accept the cooling off period that Martin Luther King and others ask them to participate in so that they can discuss things with the city, the white city county council. And many of them continue on in their efforts because Annette Jones White told me that they were impatient. They wanted things to change right then, right after, you know, they had protested and been to jail, but they didn't. And she was disappointed. And several others told me that same thing. And a lot of them ended up during their expulsion and suspension period going to the Dorchester um, SCLC voter registration, voter, voter um, registration training school. And when they came back, yes, thank you. I'm nervous, I forgot. <laughs> but anyway, um, each one of them separate in the type of activism that they choose because many of them do not end up coming back to Albany State. Even though a handful like Lula George choose to accept Dennis's uh, overture of, I guess you could say, kindness to allow them to come back if they're willing to reapply. But some, and this is how I end my presentation, some of the students that are permanently damaged from the movement and end up with post-traumatic stress disorder are Ola Mae Quarterman, who after spending um, three weeks in jail, ends up coming out with mental issues and spends 25 years of her adult life in a mental institution. Bertha Goldberg is another who ends up becoming a drug addict and an alcoholic. And Annette Jones White shared some of that data with me because Bertha Gober, when I was searching to find her, did not want to be found. Um, but still there are others like Bernice Johnson Reagan and James Jones who devote their lives to the service of civil rights. And there's a final group of those who could not continue because their life responsibilities required them to move on. And Annette Jones White, after 1963, was one of those people. And she actually wrote a poem about how she felt when she had to become a mother and a wife and was no longer an activist. Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's the end of my presentation. Any questions for Dr. Hanson? Yes. After doing your research, I want to commend you on it first, but uh, what is your view of the three presidents of Albany State? Were they men that just did what they thought was right to keep their jobs, or they weren't convinced of the movement? What is your reflection on these three men? Aaron Brown, um, out of the three, took the biggest risk. and. He was one that was willing, regardless of the price, from the things that I read about him in newspaper articles, what Lee Formwalt put in the book that he mentioned during his presentation, and another book by um, a fellow colleague named Titus Brown. Um, they talked about him in a way that spoke of him as, you know, being dedicated to, as I said, the black consciousness and raising it in the city of Albany and on that campus. He wanted, as I said, to bring it into a new age. Um, Joseph Holly, I told my students when I taught his autobiography, you can't build a chimney from the top, that because they wanted to call him an Uncle Tom. But I told them you cannot put your 21st century lenses on a man who lived in 1903 in this community. And though I tell the truth about what he did, he still, as I said at the beginning, did something that many were afraid to do. Now, William H. Dennis, to me, was a company man who was not going to change regardless of what was going on even though the stress of what he stood under finally killed him. And 
Janie Rambo shared with me, um, it's Janie Colbert Rambo, doctor, that for many years there were people in this community who accused them of killing William H. Dennis because they stressed him. And she said that was hurtful to her because he could have changed how he treated them. If you read the bylaws, and I actually have Opal Jones's set of letters where the bylaws are presented to her having been sent in the mail, he had leeway on how stringently he carried out the Board of Regents bylaws. Because like I said, Benjamin Mays was subject to those same bylaws, the president at Savannah State, because Savannah State is actually mentioned in the letter of the bylaws that I have. He had a choice on how he conducted himself. And to me, out of fear of this community, the whites within it, and fear of losing his position and his job, he went overboard. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Actually, oh. Neota Tucker does. <laughs> uh, Dr. Henry, welcome back to Albany. Thanks. Uh, you had a year and a half where you spent with students <coughs> at Albany State. Mm -hmm. Would you talk about some of those uh, experiences? And also, what challenges would you uh, make to the current students at Albany State? <laughs> Leave it to you, Neota. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, the stories that I shared with you had a huge impact on many of the students at Albany State when I would go speak at the different organization meetings. And SGA, in particular, paid attention. Now, Clarence, I believe his last name was Washington, was president of SGA at the time when I was there. And I remember him running up to Bernice Johnson Regan at the final dinner for the students in December, telling her how much she meant to him because of what they did in student government while they were there to make it possible for them to be who they were in a position of some student agency with the university. Now, my charge to the students currently at Albany State is, like those students that I mentioned and the young lady read in Ferguson, Missouri, find yourself doing the right things for your community. Stand up always for what is right and do what you believe in. Just like the students that were at Albany State in 1961, regardless of the price and the lack of popularity and the parents that told some of the students that they needed to stop marching because something bad was going to happen to them. Take the risk. Because in the end, if you stand up for what you believe in, you will come down on the right side of history when generations later it's written about. Because that's how I'd like to see myself here when, and the Yoda can attest to this, that I found out that the Georgia Board of Regents was not going to award those students honorary degrees. I told her, her and the president, it was too much collateral damage. And I told the students that if I had to go to jail as they did with my protest signs and student, current student government in front of the Georgia Board of Regents in Atlanta, then that's how the story was going to read. I'm not, I wasn't raised to be in the habit to not stand up for what you believe in, no matter who it is who does not think what you are doing is popular. Amen. So. Thank you. Yes, I hope you have I'm so glad you touched on the subject of PTS uh, among former activists. Uh, something that kind of escaped me until we began, I'm from America, America's Georgia, until we began to document and try to record oral histories of people who had been involved in, for instance, who had been jailed in Leesburg as students in Albany had been jailed. Um, and there are actually people walking around today who have those scars and refuse to talk about those experiences. They don't want you to come to their door. They don't want you to call them or anything. 
Do you know of any studies that are reflected on this as they have with veterans of the wars that we've, unjust wars we've perpetrated against people around the world? Yes, I do. I have, I have several articles. I'm sorry? I have several articles. Now, I cannot remember the titles because I ain't gonna lie, I'm a little nervous. Sure. <laughs> but <laughs> the same, I noticed the same symptoms that I read that, you know, soldiers of war talked about were some of the same things. And I didn't share all of it, but people like Janie Colbert Rambo, Andrew Williams, um, who else was it? Alton Maltry talked about the bitterness and the anger from, uh, you know, how they were treated by the university and William H. Dennis and some of their own people in the community and whites. Andrew uh, Williams said he hated white people when he left here and that he would never, and he still feels this way, that's why he uh, went to California. He would never allow the state of Georgia to have any of his tax dollars. So from the moment he was inducted into the Air Force Academy, he put down his residence as being that of his brothers in California because he said it took Andrew Young when he went to Morehouse, sitting him down, telling him that he had to move from being a revolutionary to someone who would be within the system and make it where it would evolve. He had to change it from within. And he said that is what he set out to spend his life in the Air Force doing. And he said it made him unpopular in the Air Force, but he could live with himself. He said it didn't matter to him about that. He wanted to always be found helping the underdog. And a lot of times those were people of color. Thank you. I guess you touched on one thing that, that happened, um, and this was Baker County. And there's still so many hard feelings today. The, the 17 individuals who integrated the school in Baker County were treated badly, not only by white people in the school, but by black people. They, they had to take the bus to the black school and then go from there to the white school. And they wouldn't even let them come in the building. And then they wouldn't, those seniors, those who had to go to juniors and seniors, couldn't attend the prom at the white school and couldn't attend the prom at the black school either. So, I mean, we tried to, the, the building doesn't even belong to the school system anymore down there. We, we got them to give that building to the community and we have programs there, but we couldn't even get some of them to come when we put together a program to honor them and to give them a chance to talk. Some of them still won't come and don't want to have anything to do with the, the, the building because of what they remember from back then. That's something we don't ever talk about. We don't talk about the treatment they also received in the, in the black community. I'd like to thank Dr. Henry for her presentation. Thank you so much. Dr. Henry, I know we've uh, applauded and ended this program, but would you say something about the vision and the courage of Dr. Freeman, who initiated the move to make sure that those students who had been expelled would receive the honorary degrees? Sure, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Freeman, while, while I was uh, doing manipulative things in the background, like calling the Rainbow Coalition and the local NAACP chapter, and uh, you know, getting with SGA to create a petition, was actually in the political front. He is the one that went to uh, Atlanta to talk with the chancellor and the regents um, to get them to reconsider the idea of not giving the honorary degrees to that many students. 
So finally, <laughs> he, he got um, the chancellor to agree and the chancellor went to the other regents and got them to come around and allow that many degrees to be given to the civil rights activists. And, and I'll tell you that those honorary degrees, somebody just came up to me and told me how much one of the students said that that meant to them that did not get to finish because there was, you know, 10, maybe 13 who did not go anywhere to finish college. And the fact that Albany State came back 50 years later and honored them by giving them honorary degrees meant the world to them. I was, I was telling um, Lula George just yesterday that I think I spent, as we were marching in to the James Gray um, Center, from the moment we crossed through those double doors to the minute we got up there to the city, I spent it crying because it was a work from my heart that I pressed and I fussed about. And sometimes I thought if I had to turn the world upside down, I was going to do it. And that included petitioning Dr. Freeman constantly to keep going at the chancellors because I was determined that they were going to get what they deserved. So, does that, <laughs> yes? Um, you've done so much important work at collecting these stories. Um, and I'm very sorry I missed your introduction. Are you working on, on something you will publish? Actually, this has forced me in that direction. Great. Because <laughs> I, I ended up leaving Albany because of some family issues. And I had to walk that out because nobody else could. Mm -hmm. So that paused out my research momentarily. But I'm still in the background whenever I hear about a story or someone passes me an article, I am steady collecting and archiving and putting things back for when I finally have the moment to sit down. But there, as the young lady that introduced me said, there's another group of African Americans, about 85 of them, that have, that called my name before I came here that I have to tell the world about because they've been dead for more than 200 years. Mm -hmm. And someone has to tell yeah. the story of their activism and connect it up to the long civil rights movement. But the students here at Albany are next on the agenda. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we're to begin, we're to end. Uh, but just, just what you've collected on the three presidencies uh -huh. and, uh, and the students over time, I, I think this, um, the, the PTSD you speak of and that Mrs. Sherrod spoke of, um, that is such an important story. And something that's not been talked about at any deep level in a lot of the films that I grew up seeing about civil rights activists is, oh, happy ending, we have civil rights, you know, Martin Luther King came and went, blah, 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 and nobody talks about. That's right, and how hurt they were. Because look, Bobby Birch, when I called him, he lives in New York, he was, the anger, he shot it back at me because I called as a representative of the place that had hurt him in his spirit. But over time, I think I earned his trust and the willingness to go to jail for them to have honorary degrees might have changed his mind about me. Well, <laughs> it's wonderful work uh, that you've done and are doing. I think we got one more yeah, back this there. Is, this is a comment, not a question. Um, <clears throat> talking, talking about the way that, that this story and the history has affected a lot of people and some happy stories, some happy endings to stories and some not. Uh, a few of you may know I am the daughter of a college administrator who in that era had to make some decisions about students and it angered him and put him at terrible angst to make decisions whether to protect his students 
or put them out. So, you know, we lived through that. And to the day he's been dead now for, well, since 2005. And that was one of the things that always bothered him as a college administrator, that if he made the right decision at that time. So the story is on the administrator's part side too. Just wanted to make that comment. I didn't get to talk about that, but I wanted to. I had a note to some of the administrators who were quietly involved because Irene Wright and Slater King get the unofficial transcripts of the students who have been expelled to make it possible for them to go to other HBCUs. And it was someone in the administration who did that. But those were things that people still as Ms. Shirley says, refuse to talk about. We'll bring you back and talk about it. Okay. <laughs>